Hello and welcome to the Talk of Today podcast, where we explore developments in science, technology and society, and what they could mean for the future. Today we are joined by the innovation professor Jason Potts. I've wanted to have him on the show for quite a while now because he seems to be more clued into the technological changes that are transforming our world and the economic impacts they will have, more than most economists I've come across. Jason is a distinguished professor of economics at RMIT University and co-director of the Blockchain Innovation Hub at RMIT in Melbourne, Australia. His research focuses on the economics of innovation and new technologies, economic evolution, institutional economics, and complexity economics. He has written five books and published over 80 articles on topics including growth theory, creative industries, the economics of cities, innovation commons, and more recently on crypto economics and blockchain. One book in particular, Innovation Commons, The Origin of Economic Growth, served as the basis for about half of this conversation. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, policymaker, or just anyone interested in innovation in general, Jason's book, while perhaps more of an academic read, is definitely worth checking out. In our conversation, we cover the economy as a complex adaptive system, why capitalism is a misnomer, and instead, the economic system in which most of us live might be better characterized as an institutional market society for the growth of knowledge. We explore why innovation actually begins before the creative entrepreneur, in what's called an innovation commons. And, of course, we talk about what will likely become a defining technology in this decade and those to come, blockchain. Jason explains why this will be the base layer of the emerging digital economy and why NFTs, non-fungible tokens, are the start of a new age of experimentation in property rights. If you've had any hesitancy or doubts about blockchain technology in the past, I think Jason, in this episode, will definitely change your mind. All of the links to the things discussed can be found in the show notes, uh, which will be linked below, uh, as will Jason's uh, Twitter profile. Um, I definitely recommend giving him a follow because he is a wealth of really interesting information and he's just a laugh as well. And without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Professor Jason Potts. Jason, it's uh, great to finally have the chance to speak to you. Uh, I've been wanting to, to do one of these for, for quite a while now. Um, I, was, I wanted to initially just catch up to chat about uh, crypto in general and, and to hear your take on things because I know that you know, uh, you, you've written a bit about, um, I guess, the economics of blockchain. Um, among many other things. But when I started diving into your work um, in preparation for this interview, um, I realized that you've done a lot of work on uh, innovation and um, the, I guess, how innovation can come to be. And um, I just thought that was, you know, I think I th like having read your work, I, th I think it's tremendously fascinating. And I think it's something that I really want to dive into at the beginning of this, because innovation, uh, the creation of new technologies, entrepreneurship is so foundational to growth um, to improving the world at large. And uh, I think that you've done some really interesting uh, exploring into, um, well, where it all begins. And it doesn't, and as I've learned, it doesn't begin in the hands of the, the creative entrepreneur, but actually far before, before that. So I guess before we dive into innovation and how it really comes to be, um, perhaps you could just give me a brief tour of your intellectual history, because I'd love to hear about, you know, how you, how you've come to be doing what you're doing and um, how your interests have, have um, changed and evolved over time. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me on here. This is, I'm looking forward to this. So I'm what's called an evolutionary economist. Um, it's a sort of a heterodox economist. Um, and what that has meant to me is that I've, my training in economics didn't follow a sort of mainstream neoclassical path, but really focused on um, a lot of classical economics a lot of what's called post-Keynesian economics, which is a lot of the monetary expectation stuff, um, a lot of evolutionary economics, which is built around the work of Joseph Schumpeter, um, who sort of really focused on creative destruction and um, economic dynamics. But at the core of all my work, the, the, the thing that makes me distinct as an economist, um, and then has sort of guided my career and research program, is this intersection of um, evolutionary biology and economics, evolutionary economics, with this idea that an economy is a complex evolving system. And to have that metaphor of a complex evolving system as the guiding analytic framework to understand economic dynamics. Um, that's, that's, 
that's been me right from the start, from my honors degree, through my PhD, through my entire research program, has just been developing that line, um, which has taken evolutionary economics in the sort of sense of um, you know, biological mechanisms of variation and selection uh, applied to an economy where variation comes from entrepreneurship and selection comes from market dynamics um, to give you this idea of an evolving economy. Um, what is evolving? Technology and innovation. So, and knowledge basically. So, the, my conception of an economy differs from um, a sort of mainstream. You know, and again, I, 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 you know, I consider myself. I'm not against mainstream economics. I'm very. I very much swim in those waters. Um, but where I differ is my fundamental view of an economy is not as an equilibrium system. It's not sort of drawn on you know physics. Um, techniques, but really to see an economy as fundamentally made of knowledge, um, hum, you know, humans as carriers of knowledge, um, knowledge that we carry not just individually um, in our own minds, but between us, um, which therefore makes an economy a complex system of knowledge where the ability to make any technology is not something that any one person has, but the capabilities that exist between us. Um, that's an old idea. That's Adam Smith, right? That that goes deep in classical economics. Um, you see a lot of a lot of aspects of classical economics. I still think are you know, fundamentally important um, in this, this sort of view of how an economy is an evolving, complex system. Um, that view was, to my mind, you know, when I was learning economics, the 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 person that just most resonated with me was Joseph Schumpeter. Um, also another economist called Thorsten Veblen, who's now thought of as a sociologist more, more so. Um, but this vision of an economy as being something that's not made of goods and services or commodities, but rather an economy that's made of knowledge. And um, an economic system is a set of institutions for organizing and coordinating the growth of knowledge. And that vision of an economy as an institution for coordinating the growth of knowledge and that growth of knowledge explains wealth. It explains why are some countries rich or poor? Why, you know, um, you know, where does um, you know, what does human progress consist of? It consists of the, fundamentally the role of the economic system in the driving forward of human civilization and prosperity and, and just all things that are good. Um, is fundamentally this idea of an economic system is driving the growth of knowledge. So. I find that mostly makes me an economist, but there's a bunch of sociology and politics and anthropology and psychology all mixed in with that. Um, I find that the main organizing philosophies that govern my thinking, um, I'm drawing them just as much from complex systems theory, which comes out of thermodynamics, which is you know, statistical physics, um, or evolutionary biology, which, you know, it's biology there in the title, but the thing is, biology is also the study of evolving complex systems of genetic knowledge, genes as units of 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 of, of capabilities to string molecules into into proteins that, that make organisms that you know, interact with other organisms to make ecologies and, and upwards. And that vision of you know we can effortlessly think of an ecology as a complex evolving system. Know, that is that is emergent and, and distributed and so on. Um, an economy is the same thing. An economy is also a complex, evolving ecology of knowledge. So that research program, that philosophy of, of that multidisciplinary philosophy that that um, I've always found that's that's my natural home. Um, that makes it difficult to exist neatly in a in a you know, in an economics department and published tightly in the economics journal. So I've, I've always struggled with that a little bit in my research career. But that has also been the main thing that is animating and driving the work I do and, and the, the people I work with and so on is that shared vision of an economy as a complex emergent institutional system that is centered around um, the creation of knowledge through cooperation and the, the institutions of cooperation um, you know, which are then firms and markets and other sort of things. So, you know, I, I've, I've reinterpreted economics back into that. But, um, you know, that's, I know I've, I've given you a, probably a lot, a, 
a broader answer than you asked for, but that's the... That's oh, no, wonderful, wonderful. That's uh, more than what I was looking for in, in, in the best way. Um, what that makes... So I um, studied a, a decent amount of economics at university, and I wanted to do a master's. Um, and everything that I learned was nothing that you just spoke about. And it seems to be really quite unusual that these ideas that have been spoken about for, you know, since the, at least, you know, the start of um, last century haven't really gone as mainstream as I think they are starting to go today. I feel there's a bit of a, at least from what I've been seeing online, there's a big, um, you could say, acceptance of taking up of uh, complexity science as a way of interpreting the world. And um, these evolutionary ideas, while they have, you know, had dramatic in impacts on, I guess, how we see the world, they haven't seemed to have um, entered the world of economics at the, at least from an educational standpoint, like what people are being taught in grad schools and at, at you know, master's level. Uh, because I, at the beginning of that, um, it was going to be a graduate diploma, which turned into a master's. I, I was reading um, Eric Beinhocker's uh, Origins of Wealth. Yeah, that's and I, re I read that and I was like, well, I looked at what I was going to be learning for the next two years and like, well, none of, none, none of it is this stuff. And this seems to be like the awesome stuff that's really going to give me a handle on how the world works. And I was like, well, maybe I should just take some time and actually go and re really think about what I want to be doing. So I dropped out of that. Um, and because of that book and um, just dived, at, and I guess for the past three or four years, I've been, you know, really interested in um, complexity science and because it just seems to unlock so much of the world uh, in, in, in new ways. Um, it's, just fascinating stuff. Yeah, look, that's always the way, though. So, I mean, I, I'm self-taught, as you know, almost everyone in this space has self-taught themselves this, rather than learning it in undergrad and so on. But, it, you know, but by self-taught, I mean I'm reading great books that others have written or fantastic research articles that others have written on this. So there is a vast literature that is produced um, that looks at a lot of these far more complex and interesting ways of studying an economy. Um, Nowhere do you study that in undergrad on earth. Um, that was, and we, we, we tried to do this at UQ. Um, I was at UQ for about 13 years and, um, when John Foster, um, the great John Foster, was head of that school. And we, you know, we, we, we tried to build courses that integrated this evolutionary complexity view. And you know, it, it was interesting and good. But ultimately, um, Ultimately, sort of undergrad courses become a commodified object. They're, they're more or less the same everywhere. Textbooks converge upon the same thing. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wish I'd been able to study that. I wish you'd been able to study that. Um, but, you know, I don't hold out a great deal of hope that the future will look significantly different in undergrad. But this is true of everything. This is, you know, um, if you studied psychology, for instance, um, what you learn in undergrad psychology will be very different to what you end up doing you know, in a research PhD, which will take you into far more interesting places. So, and again, I, I, I do think there's significant value in just learning the basics, like the learning the, the, the sort of the, the core standard static models. Um, there's a lot of discipline in that. There's a lot of just basic knowledge you need before you can mm. confidently go on into the higher mountains and, and study the, the more complex things. So, um, you know, thus it will ever be, but that's all the more, I mean, um, that's all the more reason to um, persist with more you know, adventurous PhDs and advanced training. Yeah, well, thank goodness we have the internet and uh, <laughs> podcasts and just well, everything yeah, at, our, at our fingertips. Uh, like these are, this is where I think the great hope for these types of um, these educational um, um, forums are. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I just want to, I guess, kind of dive into this picture of what an economy is. Uh, through this uh, relatively new lens as a non-equilibrium, you know, dynamic system that's constantly changing and evolving. Um, when you speak of um, economies basically being constituted of knowledge, um, we could think of technologies as being um, the embodiments of that knowledge, right? Like that they are our knowledge crystallized in some sense. Uh, would so you I'll make it more abstract than that. So I've done some work with a colleague of mine called Kurt Dopfer, who's a professor in um, Switzerland or in Austria now. And the, we've, we've developed a framework, um, we call it the micro meso macro framework, or we published a book called The General Theory of Economic Evolution. But what we argue is that the core economic unit is the rule, 
or the, the generic rule, and it's it's the analog of a gene. Um, and some a rule is just a, a series of instructions for ordering, you know, matter, energy, and so on, in the same way that a gene is. Um, some rules will order physical things; those are technologies. Some rules will order people; those are institutions. Um, some rules will order thinking; that's that's cognition. Um, some rules will order the interaction between humans and the world; those are behaviors. And the, it's, so it's, it's not just technologies. Technologies are one aspect of knowledge, um, but there's lots of other types of knowledge in an economy that are that are basically performing this function of, of, um, it's, you know, they're essentially rules. Um, that this turns into a that, or when you have a this, it becomes a that, or this does that, um, or this combination makes that. And what they are ordering, um, whether it's physical things, whether it's social things, whether it's behavioral things, whether it's cognitive things, determines the sort of domain of that. But economic evolution is not just evolution of technologies, it's also evolution of institutions. Markets mm. evolve, firms evolve. It's also evolution of behaviors. We have new habits and routines and preferences. It's also evolution of thinking. And um, we have new models of seeing the world and new mm. um, you know, behaviors and interactions. And economic evolution is that all of that space co-evolving together. So technologies, technologies co-evolve with institutions, co-evolve with business models, co-evolve with behaviors, co-evolve with preferences. And the sum of that the coordination of all of that together is economic evolution. Now, you know, some of that looks more psychological, some of it looks more sociological and political, some of it is core economics, that's the, the you know, the technologies and preferences thing. But, mm. um, you know, economic evolution is a very broad range of things because an economy is the sort of infrastructure that organizes all of the humans together with all of the knowledge to create the conditions for life and living and prosperity and wealth and, and so on. Yeah, I was, I was thinking the, that's the that's what we mean. And then when we talk about innovation and entrepreneurship, innovation is change in any of those rule sets. Um, you know, we're, we're used to seeing technological innovation as the main driver. In, in many ways, it is. It's the, it's the one that changes the most and the fastest, and you see it the most. But on a longer time scale, institutional evolution is just as important. On an even longer time scale, behavioral evolution is is is, is fundamental. Um, do institutions, at least in this framework, I know there's like varying definitions around here, but could institutions be seen as um, social technologies? technologies yeah, That's yeah, a way yeah. That. So I know there's we have social technologies, we have physical technologies. Yeah. These psychological, like the 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 thoughts through which you know the thoughts are patterns of thinking. Um, I intuitively, I don't want to categorize those as technologies because then we could just kind of categorize everything as a technology, right? We call that but, rationality, or we've, I, mean, I think this is one of the great blind spots in modern economics is that we've pushed that into an area where we go rational, not rational, um, the, the, you know, the, um, leave it to psychology to explain where that comes from. But you know, just a huge amount of the cre of creation of value in an economy is. Um, coming up with new behaviors, new ways of doing things, new habits and routines. And this is something that a lot of the classical economists saw this very clearly. Um, people like Boston Veblen and a lot of the institutional economists really fundamentally saw this role of habits and routines and behaviors and, you know, and, and how they differed between groups of people as being fundamental. Now, once you've got an evolutionary understanding of that, we can start to bring culture into the story. And we can start to think about culture as something that is um, you know, a constraint, an enabler, a, you know, an enabler of trust, a, a, a means of creating um, coordination and units of organization. Um, so much of the power of an economy, I mean, you know, an economy is just a vast system of, cooper of cooperation. Right? Some of those units of cooperation we call firms, where you've all got the same goal. Some of these units of cooperation we call households, which are things that have the same um, you know, access to resources. Some of these units of cooperation are nation states, which all have the same governing rule sets and so on. So, um, you know, and the forces that hold that together and that, that lower the transactions cost of that cooperation um, is, is just as much part of economics as, as anything else. So I, I'm sort of, I mean, this is one of the points in which I'm quite critical of the way we currently frame economics is it's 
just you know firms, markets, prices, commodities, et cetera, et cetera, and just holds everything else constant. I, I think that's a fundamental category error. Um, just simply because so much of the explanation of dynamics comes from changes in um, thinking, behavior, mm. um, social coordination. And do you think that myopia is a sort of a, a function of just the the blinders that have been put on by the assumptions of neoclassical economics? Well, like, I mean, I would almost have it the other way around. I think, you know, neoclassical economics, along with, you know, modern psychology and other sort of other fields of study, are just, um, they're just territories that have been marked out um, and, you know, um, that are convenient for education purposes and so on. Um, so, you know, the way we, you know, these schools of, you know, th th these disciplines and subject areas, um, we tend to think of them as natural categories. Of course, there's economics here and psychology there and sociology there, but they're relatively modern inventions. Um, those boundaries were way blurrier um, 100 years ago. Or oh, natural science back, well, oh, natural, yeah. natural philosophy rather, well, back in the day, yeah. Political arithmetic and so on. So I, I sort of, I, I, I like to live in a world where I think these, I don't respect those boundaries as much as other people do, I think. And I, and I, I do that from a, not from an iconoclastic perspective. I just don't think it's that useful. I think you just, mm. you end up just um, treating things as parameters or fixed that aren't actually fixed. And when you're, when the core thing you're trying to explain, which is you know, my research program is economic dynamics. How do economies change through time? Um, I need to have a fairly broad conception of change um, in order mm. to try and do that well. So, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm far more comfortable rolling in other fields and just treating this all as an evolutionary social science centered around economics understood as the growth of knowledge. Yeah, well, that's brilliant. And I'm very glad you do. <laughs> um, one, before we move on to, I guess, exploring what really uh, institutions are, I do want to focus um, just for a bit on um, markets and capitalism and the... So a lot of um, ire and, I guess, anger and angst is directed towards this thing called capitalism. Um, and I think that we are uh, some of us are at risk of throwing out the baby with the bathwater because it is without a question that um, the machine of capitalism spews uh, you know noxious fumes which are smothering the earth right uh, in the form of climate change and all of that however capitalism has delivered us from uh, poverty at least you know 19 out of 20 people used to live in poverty way back when now it's 1 in 20 or something or other um, and it's not all I, in this in, uh, through this lens of I guess the economy as a complex adaptive system that's current that's constantly evolving, uh, placing selective pressures on certain technologies and ways of doing things. Um, this uh, capitalism is not this um, this evil thing, but rather it's just something that itself could evolve, and uh, it is indeed actually tremendously useful. So I guess my question is, could you explain? how markets place selection pressures on uh, new technologies and new ways of doing things and uh, I guess why this is actually quite important for the our uh, for progress for the growth of well-being for just making the world a better place because I don't think enough attention is being actually put on that um, yeah. in um, so just first up I don't call it capitalism capitalism was Marx's term and he, he meant to insult it by by pointing to capital as the object that was at the center of it. I, I don't believe that for a second. Capital is not the center of um, this institutional order. I, I, it's a market economy, it's a market society. Um, but the the core of it is knowledge, not capital. Capital is a is a, an accumulative fixed form of, of, of knowledge that's created through investment. Um, what evolves isn't capital, or what changes isn't capital, or what it, it's it's this is a growth of knowledge economy. Um, markets are mechanisms to coordinate um, human action, right? So I'm I, I very much frame this in the this is where I would identify more strongly as an Austrian economist from this perspective. Um, I think what we're dealing with is an evolving, complex knowledge system, and markets are the most natural mechanism to facilitate 
that growth of knowledge process. So I don't really ever feel a need to use the word capital to describe this. Um, you know, that's a political word. Um, yeah, and it kind of bothers me because these words are thrown around, you know, capitalism, socialism, and no one knows what the hell we're talking about. Like half the time, I mean, most people wouldn't actually be able to point to it and say that's capitalism or that is. It's just this, this phantom that exists in the minds of, of many. So I contrast the system we have now, um, you know, a market economy, not in terms of a capitalism versus socialism or not capitalism, the planning systems, but a market economy versus a versus an, a um, a feudal economy, where you've got, I think, the the you know the modern order that we that we we live in um, evolved out of a feudal order, where you had, um, you know. Was, was essentially characterized by static knowledge. You had the kings or the lords and manors and so on would rule over the serfs and there would be fixed social relationships, fixed and governed ways of seeing the world, fixed and governed jobs and positions in society, um, fixed and governed knowledge. Um, there was no mechanisms for creating new knowledge. And the world that we've, you know, our modern world differs from the previous world because of this set of mechanisms for growing knowledge. Those set of mechanisms for growing knowledge, if you want to call it capitalism, we can call it that. I prefer the idea of calling it a market society, but that's what's new and different. Now, that old world, um, you know, it was fantastic if you're at the top of the pile, it was probably horrible if you're at the bottom of the pile, but the one thing you knew is that you weren't going up or down. You were, whatever you were born into was what you would die into. Um, there was, you know, the future would look like the past. It was just static. There was no new knowledge. Um, you know, there was bread and there was horses and there was, you know, an economy that was producing stuff. Um, it was just never producing new stuff and never destroying old stuff. And not just things. It was never creating new types of positions in society. There was never new jobs. There were never new forms of organization. Um, we didn't even have the concept of a company. We had armies or the king. Um, or work groups for doing stuff. So this idea of dynamics in organizational forms of cooperation, dynamics in things to do with your life, jobs, dynamics and in innovation in stuff that existed, all of that is this new thing we have. Um, so that's my sort of framing of this. Now, you raised the point about this, well, this new thing that has all this new stuff has caused all these new problems. Now we've got pollution and global warming and a whole lot of new just catastrophes that we didn't have back in the feudal era. Um, absolutely. That's definitely what happened. There's no, but, and was that caused by this mechanism? Absolutely it was. So that's what, you know, you do the new thing and you had these new consequences. But what, you know, where my faith resides is not in overthrowing the system to go back to the old system where we were fine, um, but rather leaning further into this new system going, okay, we've got a new problem, we've got to solve this new problem. And in order to solve a new problem of, you know, we're running out of polar bears and we're running out of um, cool spaces on earth and we've got too much of this and not enough of that, is those are knowledge problems. Um, they're either knowledge problems or they're institutional problems. We've, we're over, and some things are too, you know, um, we've got externalities we need to deal with. Or we, you know, so there's, you know, very much institutions need to evolve to um, endogenize those things. Now, some of that will be public policy. Some of it will be done through um, new types of behaviors that we can coordinate upon. Um, lots of people in society have coordinated on the idea that you know, we can be less wasteful in, in our own personal consumption. Um, you know, we've had government pushing us, but we've also done that ourselves by pressuring each other and shaming those who consume more. So there's cultural mechanisms, there's social mechanisms, there's behavioral feedback mechanisms, there's regulatory mechanisms. Um, you know, at some point we'll need to say that stuff has to stay in the ground or that stuff has to stay in the sky. Um, but again, all of that is just institute is dynamics, right? And the more knowledge we have, the more capabilities we have as a society, the easier those problems are to deal with. So Again, I, I, what I reject is the political framing of the, of the solution space. I don't see political solutions to economic problems. I see economic solutions to economic problems. Um, my main critique of the world right now is that we are obsessed with political solutions and voting as solutions. And, you know, um, whereas you know, I, I'm very much a sort of Silicon Valley guy, that I, I think most of our solutions come from better tech and, and just 
and, and, and tech in this not you know not the latest thing on your bloody yeah, iphone but tech in this expansive new knowledge yeah. new ways of doing things wherever it comes from um and that means we need to create the institutions for doing that we need healthy venture capital markets so i'm, I'm very much you know we need more finance not less um finances can get us into a lot of trouble when it spins its wheels and blows up the price of houses and so on but venture finance is absolutely critical to start to funding the exploration of new ideas. Um, you know, the, um, I love the implication that doing new stuff means we'll probably have to stop doing other stuff. Um, so, you know, which means existing jobs or businesses um, will sometimes often need to be destroyed. Um, that's horrible and painful for those who go through it. And that's the role of politics is, 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 is helping those people or companies or resources through that transition process. Um, so I, again, my, I don't like to sort of politics that's based around the idea of stopping the world in its tracks or just freezing things up or trying to make it like it was in the past um, to protect things. So, um, you know, I, I, again, the, what in a, an economy is a set of institutions and mechanisms for creating new stuff and developing new knowledge. Um, and that's, that's going to, that's going to be disruptive. I don't see politics as above economics. I see it the other way around. The role of politics is to sort of facilitate um, economic mm. development. Now, um, again, that's a that's that's a perspective that I've developed, and I, I, mm. and I, but I, I think a lot of the discussions that we end up having around you know the relationship between the economy, sustainability, political crises, globalization, and so on, gets caught up in this idea that these economic problems have political solutions. Yeah. Um, this discussion of, I guess, uh, the economic instruments that can be used to bring about the change that's necessary reminds me of, I, I, I might be wrong, but it might, one of my main takeaways from the book I mentioned before, The Origins of Wealth, was that, and I also got this kind of from um, the entrepreneurial state that I've read more recently. I can't remember her name, um, but it, it's, it's this notion. Mariana, sorry? Mariana Mezzacuto. Yes, that's it. That's it. Um, it's it's this notion that the government sort of like through this evolutionary framing sets the fitness function for um, the operating environment. They, they they sort of just sets not not entirely, but like it, it plays a tremendous role in saying here's the sorts here are the sorts of solutions that we desire and creating incentives to try to bring those about. So it's kind of like the the gardener. Uh, in a way, put, you know, um, giving attention to uh, plants that need more attention because we want them to bear fruit, pulling out the weeds that we think are terrible, you know, putting up retaining walls, doing all the all that sort of stuff to, like, so, so interfering, but in uh, so that the um, new solutions and new ways of doing things can kind of come to be and emerge. Um, is, is that the right way of uh, thinking about the role of government, uh, at least from? Yeah, I, I think. Mariana Mazzucato has 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 the right question in the sense that she's focusing very clearly on this idea of, of you know, a, a growing prosperous a growing economy and an evolving economy as a necessary thing, and she fundamentally identifies innovation policy as the core that sort of thing that government needs to focus on. Um, I don't have quite as much confidence as she does in the ability of government to predict what that space will look like. Um, and, but again, this is, a, this is a debate between reasonable people about how far you can push that argument. Um, I, prefer, I prefer far more market experimentation and government cleaning up afterwards. Her preference is for government to set a sort of series of tracks for markets to run down. Um, again, um, reasonable people can disagree about that. And, and, and you know, who knows what, you know, maybe we need both. And that's yeah. um, But this idea, I think you know what we what we do agree on very clearly is that the central role of government here is to facilitate innovation and 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 to, to facilitate the design of economic rules to drive um, you know to drive the growth of knowledge and, and, and transformation um, forward. So on that, um, what I would direct your listeners to, I mean. Mariana Mezzacuto's books are, are very good on this. She's, she focuses a lot on what's called mission-oriented um, innovation and, and the role of government in selecting big missions, like you know, going to the moon or curing cancer and so on, and just directing um, 
innovation resources toward that. Um, I'm a big fan of the economic historian Joel Moikia, and he's written a fantastic book recently called The Culture of Growth, which sort of sets out the same story told from this perspective of the 17th, 18th, 19th century around this idea of, of just exploration of exploration of knowledge and just how a lot of the things that we sort of just take as obvious for granted directions to go in now that you can point to and go, okay, that's clearly, you know, a, a, a well-meaning king or a well-meaning government would obviously want us to go in that direction. Um, those things were much harder than, than, we, than we initially thought. So I'm, I'm just more of the perspective that the role of government is more to facilitate experimentation, which mostly means allowing it and cleaning up the mess afterwards and trying to minimize the risk in the process rather than standing at the front and leading the, the, the march. Um, that's, but the only reason, I, the only reason I, I, I argue that is I just think it's a really, really hard thing to do, that you're going to get wrong mm. most of the time. Um, entrepreneurs are good at being wrong because they're playing with someone else's money. Um, they can start another company. That's fine. It's it's a badge of pride. Politicians don't like failure. They tend to be punished for it. Voters will never forgive them for a huge catastrophic mistake. Whereas, um, which is not what you need. If if the if the goal is to develop new technologies, we need to make a lot of mistakes. We need to go down a lot of. We need to try a lot of things. And a, a fantastic example of this is um, uh, vaccines. Right. So. Um, in the past year, we have had this, this unbelievable leap of technology and in, 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 in new types of vaccines, these this of, um, um, mRNA, RNA ones that, that, you know, just wildly radical new approaches to vaccines. Vaccines have been stuck for 80 years in a bunch of you know, just ways we thought we could build them. And you know, just a whole lot of things that we knew were viral that we could never fix, and and suddenly, in one year, because we had to, because we just more or less just said, look, just try everything, just throw money at it, try whatever you can. We've got like six new, whole new genre types of, of vaccines that have been developed and built and pushed out to market in the space of a year. Um, I read that as an example of what happens when you look at, when you pull back the restraints and just go, look, let's just try everything because we have to. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, what that does is it makes me more optimistic about a whole bunch of other big, hard tech problems, including global warming, including um, just uh, dealing with, you know, back, um, um, sort of all sorts of resistant, bacteria resistance sort of things and just, you know, um, solar cells and just whatever, right? There's a whole lot of things that, um, when we are willing to make more mistakes and, and tolerate more failure and just push harder, we can deliver a whole lot of new stuff. Um, the other example I'll give of this that, that is that is in my wheelhouse right now is the whole crypto space. Um, that's the thing about, I, I'm an innovation economist, I study innovation, and I tend to go where I think the most fascinating parts of the innovation economy are. And for the last five years, just absolutely by far the most interesting part of innovation is, is, is in crypto and blockchain um, because it has just been moving so fast you know we've just it's the, the 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 cycle time between development of a new bit of tech and adoption and, and building it out is, is just months not years and so on um, that's a good example of an area where that is against Mazzucudo's thesis you know there's no sort of government departments that are driving this or large publicly funded research centers devoted to it um, in fact there's you know there's a lot of effort to try and stop it so, and again, I, I'm just, this is one case example. I, I don't mm. want to get in on that too much, but these are sort of vaccines in the crypto space are two just very recent examples where we've seen enormous acceleration of innovation, um, precisely when we were just willing to try everything and experiment. And, 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 um, in the vaccines case, money, no object. In the crypto space, um, it's all outside of the regulatory direction. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, Nothing. and it's because money is no object that crypto is getting, you know, getting more back as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, money so, prints a gober. <laughs> innovation can move very, very quickly, and, and it still can. And, you know, we, we're not at, I, I don't think we're at a kind of uh, point where we've picked all the low-hanging fruit and, you know, the, the golden era of innovation is behind us. I think we're still, especially in the digital space, and the thing about the, the vaccine space is that it's digital biology. Um, so, you know, 
there's you know the next thing will be quantum and we'll be able to hit hit this stuff with massively more powerful computing then we're going to go into machine learning and you know artificial intelligence and deep learning and so on so uh, you know the, the the space of technological opportunity i think is still is still expanding in front of us so i'm i'm more concerned about how do we move quickly into that space um the the, the opportunity cost of slowing down um, worries me a lot less than the, the, the what, what we're missing out on. You know, mm. I'm with Elon Musk on this. I, I think we're yeah. not pushing hard enough. Yeah. Um, I think I'd like to come back to this discussion about, um, I guess, the role of government and, and innovation. Uh, but perhaps after we come, after we explore what the innovation commons uh, actually is, um, it, just briefly before we get onto that, um, could you explain what an institution is? So I understand, so an institution means something slightly different in different fields. Um, in economics, institutions are the rules of the game, referring to the rules. So it's the, the set of constraints within which behavior is permitted, right? So that's a kind of institutions as the box in which society mm -hmm. moves and you shift the sides of the box, you change the types of behaviors that are permitted. So economists understand institutions as the set of rules or the payoff matrix yeah. that, 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 that defines the set of behaviors. So they're um, everywhere. Like I, I, my friend group is an institution of sorts because there, there are rules by which we interact. There are things that we do and things that we don't yeah. do and they so are they're mutually. An institution. But yeah. the thing, what it's doing, what the institution is doing is an institution is a rule that coordinates social interaction, right? Um, now for what is an economy, an economy, is made of cooperative social interaction in order to create and use knowledge to make stuff, do stuff, trade things. Um, so institutions are, are social technologies that define the type of cooperation that we can do. Um, so we, we'll get to this soon, I, I, I hope, but I sort of think of blockchains as a social technology that automates a lot of these. Yeah, yeah. The reason why I wanted, I, I thought it'd be good to talk about um, institutions and innovation commons and using blockchain and distributed ledger technologies as like a perhaps a case study or a way to flesh out the uh, the the our understanding. I, if, if we're going to explore the space of what is an, an an innovation commons, what is an institution, we could do so in the context of crypto because it's quite new. We are seeing um, there are new innovation commons um, just by virtue of the fact that we have the internet. Um, do you think that's a decent way to kind of explore these yeah, okay. uh, these ideas? So, I mean, I can talk, I just want to talk about what I mean by innovation commons because um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's there's, what there's two words there. There's innovation and commons. Innovation is growth of knowledge. Um, commons is a type of organizer is a is a is a way of organizing um, people around resources. So, um, we can organize people and resources with property rights, where we go, this is mine, this is yours. Um, property rights enable us to have markets, right? So you can't have markets without property rights because a, a market is an exchange mechanism that transfers property rights. Um, I give you my thing, you give it, um, you give me something else. So property rights gives us markets. Firms are another way to organize people um, with hierarchy. So you have someone giving instructions, rules, passing rules down, you will do this, blah, 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 down. So we can use hierarchical organization. Um, a government is also a hierarchical organization that's a compulsory one, a firm is a voluntary one. So we've got voluntary hierarchy, compulsory hierarchy, property rights and markets. The other form of organization are commons. And a commons is an institution where we've got some rules about how we're going to govern the, our, our use of a shared resource. So a commons is an institution built around a common pool resource. So that resource might be a traditional one is a forest where we are you know, hunting in it or, or gathering berries in it or whatever, or a fisheries or a watershed or access to, a, to, a, to, to, to water or, or, some, or, or, or um, the atmosphere that we, we, we breathe. So a commons is a way of coordinating or coordinating a group of people, a social institution around a, a resource. Um, but that resource could also be privately held. We could turn this into a market, or it could be publicly held. We could turn it into a common, a, a public good. Um, the thing about a commons 
is that a commons is in many situations a very efficient way to organize humans um, because what it does is it trades on the idea of a community and there's a group of people that already know each other that trust each other um, that can at very low cost coordinate their use of a shared resource so we tend to see commons work quite well we have stable communities so access to a community resource um, a community garden for instance can be a commons um, the sidewalk can be a commons um, but commons the problem with commons is plural is that they're subject to free riding um, i can go in and just take all the berries in the forest and now there's none for you um, so you've got to have a way of punishing me or restraining my free riding on that um, at some point property rights um, i can take you to court or public goods um, i can put you in prison are solutions to that problem but they're high cost solutions it's expensive to run a property rights system um, you know one in every 10 people in your population has to be a lawyer um, it's expensive to run a government you know one in every 10 people in your population has to be a politician or a policeman or whatever with that so you know the public goods and the market society ones are both solutions but they're, they're relatively expensive solutions Thing about a commons when it works well is it's efficient and very low cost um, the problem with commons is that they don't scale very well they tend to work well for small groups they don't tend to work well for big groups this is why the commons in a street around you know can we just have a shared park amongst the people in my street cannot will probably work pretty well um, but it completely fails for the global for co2 in the global atmosphere that's also a commons that we've just ruined um, it's easy for me to pollute it and it's difficult for you to punish me um, so that's a commons, innovation commons, put this together and just go, um, so to me, the fundamental question in not just economics, but in just in society is how do we grow knowledge? What is the best way to grow knowledge? Because everything depends on that. If we've got effective institutions for growing knowledge, we can do anything. We can, we can solve every problem. We can, um, we can make poverty go away. We can make all health problems. Everyone can have everything they want. We can solve the economic problems you define it. We can live on Mars. We can do whatever, right? Um, the growth of knowledge is the fundamental constraint on human flourishing. So this is why the innovation problem, and this, again, this is why you know, I'm very much agree with um, Mezzacuto that you know, putting innovation as the fundamental thing government has to get right is absolutely correct. It's the, the central economic problem. It's not just the allocation of scarce resources. I don't buy that at all. The central economic problem is how do we grow knowledge to make scarcity go away? Um, so the organization or the institutions of innovation is the fundamental question we should be asking in economics. And this brings us to this, okay, so how do we organize innovation? And um, well, we have firms. Firms create you know, new ideas and they try and push them to market. And for that, we need effective property rights and markets and venture capital. And you know, we need a whole lot of, you know, our market institutions need to work very well if firms are gonna be the mechanism we're gonna to use to grow knowledge. Um, public science, universities, government research departments have produced a huge amount of knowledge. And this was what Mariana Mazzucuda was pointing to when she go when she you know said showed her iPhone and said, look, most of this was built in government research departments. True, but it was commercialized, it was the innovations took place in the market. And so so you know so, so we, we can we could rely more on public funding. Um, we could we could use that mechanism. But if that's the case we need um, we need to we need to politicize innovation. We need to you know, basically deal with this question. Okay, what should we be innovating on? Both um, this way. Um, I that could work. I'm less trustful of that because um, voting tends to. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of, of, of voting if if the objective is to is to is on new to things. Fight. That's the whole. It kind of goes against the the general aim. Like novelty is um, interesting because it's new and kind of. Uh, well, technically it is new, but it's it's um, it's surprising, right? Like the yeah. whole point is like one person has a crazy idea and it just so happens to be awesome. At the beginning, everyone yeah. thinks it's madness. And that's always the case. So you don't want to be a politician proposing new ideas. That's the worst possible position or or backing new ideas. So, I mean, I, I would it would probably work pretty well if we politicized 
innovation and have large research departments doing it. And in a lot of ways, that's what universities are. Universities are a very old institution. They've been around for almost a thousand years because they work at growing knowledge. So we, we, we have got a significant societal investment in that mechanism. Um, we've also got a huge societal investment in um, using markets and property rights and intellectual property and venture capital. And you know, Silicon Valley is, the just, is, is, is evidence of just the enormous success of that. Um, the problem for me, though, is that it's, it's even harder than that. So um, entrepreneurs are a key mechanism in, in, in coming up with new ideas and driving them. But the question is, where do entrepreneurs get their ideas from? How do they see opportunities? And my argument around the innovation commons is that the very notion of even seeing opportunities, what can we do with this knowledge? is itself a collective action problem that requires cooperation. And um, now, one solution is that we just rely on genius entrepreneurs. So we, we go, Elon Musk, fantastic. Come up with more ideas, Elon. Um, or we, we go back in history and we go, OK, um, Bill Gates or, 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 or Steve Jobs. Um, you know, we rely on the genius entrepreneur that can have all of the ideas. But that's a pretty risky strategy, and it's putting all our eggs in a very small number of baskets and just hoping that these we've got the right geniuses in the right place at the right time to have the right ideas and start the right companies. And what my belief is, and my evidence for this is things like open source software, is that by far the best technologies we've got weren't actually created by single geniuses, but were basically built by groups of people working cooperatively together. Just, I'll build this person, you build that person, no one's actually in charge, and wow, we've got Wikipedia, or wow, we've got, um, you know, we've, we've, um, we've got you know, um, Linux or, or whatever, right? And I think it's the same thing with innovation and entrepreneurship, is that um, a lot of ideas aren't the product of you know lone genius we tend to ascribe that after the event and point to that but um, you know there's a reason that there are certain places are just more fertile than others and at the moment sort of silicon valley is our favorite example but historically there have been lots of other places you know, venice in the 16th century or um, sort of um, amsterdam in the 17th century and so on where there was just a lot of activity there was a lot of um, just People gathering in coffee houses, or people gathering in these in these sort of you know places that where people came together and shared ideas. Those were commons, commonses. They were commonses of ideas, where ideas came together. Um, in a lot of ways, the success of a university is the fact that you just put a lot of smart people in the same space, and sort of ideas percolate and they share. And eventually, someone takes credit for it. So it looks after the event like some a per one person innovated that. But this idea of institutions for creating idea discovery as a common pool resource, um, I think this is, this is what I mean by an innovation commons. And what that means is that you know, I have a conception here of fundamental cooperation to pool bits of ideas, or I've seen this, or I saw that bit, or I've got a solution to that, you know, just... Um, and this is, again, this is Adam Smith. We, we specialize. We know um, you, you'll have things that you know. I've got things that I know. But when we come together, we can pool and share that information and realize new ideas or new breakthroughs, or we can see new opportunities. And that, that notion of thinking of idea discovery or value discovery or opportunity discovery as a common pool resource that we can, we can build is a large part of what you know, really successful startups have that. I mean, this is, I'm describing a cultural phenomenon. I'm describing a, a phenomenon of a successful human cooperation as a cultural institution to discover ideas. And, you know, to me, that's, that's the answer to the question, what is driving all of, you know, what is the ultimate driver of innovation? It's not loan genius. It's not finance. Um, it's not venture capital, or it's not R&D tax credits that are, sponsoring companies that have already, all of that is already down the path. Um, when you're at that stage, you've already kind of spotted the opportunity. The real scarcity is coming up with this, with this, these mechanisms for seeing opportunities or discovering sources of value by pooling and creating knowledge. Um, so I, you know, I, I very much see this as, you know, to loop back, we just, one of the critiques that people often make of capitalism is that it's competitive. 
competitive in a bad way that's you know, wasteful and harmful. I think that fundamentally misunderstands this institutional system we call a market economy. It's fundamentally a cooperative society um, that uses competition between cooperative groups to accelerate it. But the fundamental binding energy of a market society is high quality trust and cooperation between people pooling and sharing ideas. Um, that's a that's you know that's a firm at its best. Um, that's a you know, that's a uni you know all of the sources of wealth and value creation have that property. Now sometimes we ascribe that to a place and go there's some magic about this region, um, or that particular geography or that place at a particular time and just go I can't believe so many good ideas come out of San Francisco or New York or or Venice or whatever. Um, no, it's not, the, it's not the geography that's doing that. It's that that was a place where groups of people were able to come together and trust each other and cooperate and share um, at low cost. Um, what those places tend to not have is a whole lot of protection or intellectual property rights or this is mine. You know, they're, they're often very um, cooperative, open, sharing places. This is a thing that you notice about them. It's not an accident. It's not a, a side feature of it. Um, a lot of these mechanisms of intellectual property, I'm, I'm very much against intellectual property. I think it's, it's ultimately harmful for mm. I was going to ask you that, but yeah, keep, keep on going. But I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that you need in place in order to get property rights mechanisms to work, in order to get markets to work. So, but again, that only happens once you've got the engine running, once you've got this engine mm. of recovery running. So, I, I mean, what this leads me to is this idea that... The fundamental question in economics is where does new ideas, where, where does innovation come from? That's that's the driver of it. But that is fundamentally an answer, that is fundamentally a question that has an institutional answer. It's not an allocation of capital. It's a design of institutions to facilitate cooperation. And when you have that, that high quality institutions that facilitate um, the sharing and pooling of ideas to create a common pool resource that enables opportunity and idea discovery or technology discovery. And sometimes this will take place within a firm. Sometimes, you know, a really great firm, you know, for a while there, Google looked like this from the inside. I'm not sure if it still does. Um, back in the 70s, the Bell Research Laboratories in New York were, were like that, um, or Xerox Park in, in, in San Francisco. But you know, there have been firms that have had looked like this. Um, a high-performing research team at a university has the same feel to it. Um, you know, a really great um, um, sort of consulting company that, that is just you know, um, can also do this. So, you know, so lots of firm, firms can look like this, but so can places, regions, geographies, spaces. But in each case, what you're describing is a, a community of people um, that have that are able to safely cooperate and pull and share ideas to create a common resource that enables them to discover new technologies, new ideas, new opportunities, new new ways of behaving. Um, and you know, some of these things look nothing like, you, know, you don't think of them as the economy. There's, some of these things might look a bit cult-like. Some of, you know, some of the um, greatest ideas of, of the 20th century actually weirdly came out of hippie communes and, 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 weird, and places. Um, because they had the same underlying property of it was safe to cooperate, to pull ideas, to create new resources. Um, I've spent a lot of time studying the origin of new sports, um, such as mountain biking or um, we've been kite surfing recently. And it's the same thing. Groups of enthusiasts come together to pull and share ideas about designs they've come up with or you know, just little modifications they've made. And out of that, they build a new sport. What is a new sport is technologies plus rules for how to organize that and off the back of that you get new companies and markets and then you know and now we've got you know Burton snowboards and whatever or whatever mountain bikes but the market entrepreneurial finance build a startup into a business that's that's 17 steps down the line of innovation it's not where it starts it actually starts a lot sooner and you know so I see the role of government here stepping in to accelerate stepping in to, to, to clean up any messes that are made but to me, the real driver of this isn't government or, or firms or even you know, brilliant entrepreneurs. The real driver of this is just safe, enthusiastic human cooperation around knowledge, around the creation of mm. knowledge. Um, and you know, again, I don't know what policy looks like when you do that. Um, 
but it's it's not based around R and D tax credits or things. Um, I think we accidentally get it right with universities, um, or we at least we did in the past. I hope we will still do that. I'm, I'm less. Um, I'm, I'm more worried about the future of universities now. That you know, and when you treat universities as businesses, you're kind of killing off that. Um, so you know, again, this this. I think it's easier for governments to mess this up than it is for them to get it right. But at mm. least part of the plan here is, um, you know, because what I'm describing here in a lot of ways is, is um, enlightened wastefulness or, you know. A, a but see, in the long run, it's actually efficient, right? Like that's what evolution's like. Oh. It's, it's inefficient if you look at the isolated instance, but like the search costs uh, quite like, Evolution's kind of the only thing we've got for you know surviving across time, and it looks wasteful initially. Right, but... and that's a huge lesson that we take that you know that evolutionary biology has taught us is, is that wow, that's wasteful, but on a short period of time, but on a long period of time, how did it do that? That's amazing. And it's, well, it brought it's, us it's, here, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, well, you know, really so, that. But I just take that as, as meaning you know experimentation. I mean, what we're dealing with is a growth of knowledge problems, meaning we're dealing with uncertainty and ignorance and we're going to make mistakes and so on. And it's not so much we must avoid making mistakes. It's just we need to just lower the cost of making mistakes. We just need to. And when we discover new things, we need to figure out how to use them in such a way that we minimize the disruption that they cause. Or we, we, mm. you know. So I think a lot of, a lot of um, economic policy tries to protect existing knowledge rather than try and facilitate the growth of knowledge. So, you know, again, I, we shouldn't be protecting jobs. We should be protecting workers. Um, yeah, we should yeah. be protecting people. Um, it's, we, it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's something that kind of um, annoys me about some of the, the uh, discourse around uh, automation, that, oh, you're destroying these people's jobs. and. I see it as liberation. It's like, well, these people actually don't be spending their time doing this anymore. And it's not the company's um, responsibility to ensure that they are okay. It's actually the role of the government. So your IA shouldn't be directed towards the companies. It should be directed towards the government and ensuring that everyone is taken care of and has their has yeah, healthcare, exactly. basic needs. I agree yeah. with that. I think that's the right framing of this. Um, it's, you know, it requires a certain boldness because you have to, um, you know, you. There's, there's, there's very clear lobbying. There's, there's a, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a person there that has a job and, and, and suffering and will vote against you if you do not offer to protect them. But, um, I, you know, I, I think this is a, this is a great lesson of the 20th century was the costs of doing that. That um, more automation is coming, and it's it's not just going through the, you know, the the blue collar and mechanical parts of it. It's coming for the white collar jobs. It's coming for it's coming for all of For anyone listening out there who wants, if you're not aware of like probably the biggest development in artificial intelligence, at least I've ever seen, GPT-3. I mean, if you want to, if you want to have your um, university essays written, just <laughs> leave it to them. Leave it to yeah, GPT-3. Beginning of this as well. So, you know, so, so, I mean, more disruption is coming, and we need to figure out how to just you know, how to how to flourish and make use of these new technologies. I mean, they, they, they are disruptive. There will be harmful ways of using them, um, but there will also be lots of amazing surprises that we can put these to. And I, I've, I'm a big fan of um, an economist at George Mason University, Tyler Cohen. He's written a lot of quite, you know, what I think is some very good works on, on this. Um, but his point is, he points to chess and goes, the, f the, you know, the thing about chess computers is it's not that human beats chess computer and, you know, and until they don't, or chess computer beats human and, and now forever. It's that the, the winning strategies right now, even in, in something as, as rule bound as chess, is actually human and computer working together can beat anything. They can beat computer by itself or, or human by themselves. Um, and, and that's a model for what this is going to look like in the future, is that this you know, automation that's coming out of machine learning and the Boston Dynamics dogs and whatever, right? Whatever's coming, is that what both history teaches us, and you know, and it, this this is, this will continue to be the case, is that it's not the case that just you know, you're, gradually the machines will take all the jobs and there'll be nothing left for the humans to do. It's that the humans will be made far more powerful and capable and find interesting new things to do with machine, cooperating with machines. Um, um, and 
the ability to do that, I think, is the fundamental capability that we need to develop here. And that's a role for education. That's a role that many people will need help with. Um, I think this is the great digital divide, or that this is how this is the risk of leaving people behind is if, if they can't effectively work with the new technologies, mm. not against them, not instead of them, but with them. Mm. And, and, I, and I, so I see. Um, to my mind, it's education that is the thing that we need to reform most. And you know, our education system is built around an industrial economy where you slot it into a system with a machine or with an, uh, with an organizational apparatus. Um, I think we're starting to see shifts in universities now where you know, we'll, 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 you know, we talk about lifelong learning and so on. I think that's a little bit glib and cliched, but this idea of, of, of needing to continuously retool um, to sort of stay at the front or to, to, to learn how to work with whatever the latest thing is, is something that we're going to need to figure out how to do. Now, whether that's universities and credentials, whether it's podcasts, whether it's just groups of people coming together and teaching themselves and, and you know, do we need certification? I don't know. But I think um, the one missing piece of the puzzle right now is massive education reform in the education system. I think you know, we're still living in a almost medieval education system um, that is... It is, you know, it works well for some people, but there's a lot of people that it's failing and mm. leaving them a huge amount of debt and, and not, a, not a great deal of ability to function. No, no. Uh, my experience and many of my contemporaries is just you pay for a piece of paper and your education you get from YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I just, this, this discussion of innovation commons, um, the way that I kind of, um, I get one of the key words that really stuck out to me was um, uncertainty. So you, the entrepreneur cannot go out and create if the, uh, well, they can't go out and create if they don't have the inputs for the, for the idea. So the role of the innovation commons, I, perhaps role is the wrong word, but it's this distributed network of individuals who have little pieces of what could be the puzzle or even before the puzzle pieces, like little bits that when they're brought together, um, give an idea of what the opportunity could actually look like. So it's yeah, the, they're forging, they're forging the puzzle pieces. And that's why it's so hard for the government to do it because the government, they, they can't do that. All they can do is really create space for that in, in yeah, a way. I, 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 I like the way you put that. And, and I think that is, um, the economists call that the knowledge problem. And the basic argument, and this was, this was made very clearly by um, Hayek, in an article, 1945, The Use of Knowledge in Society, um, is, is, is just simply that mar what markets are very good at doing is piecing together distributed knowledge. Um, because you know, each person will know a little bit about local environment and conditions, and they'll have a little bit of insight into demand conditions here or supply conditions there. And by their actions in a the market, they bid prices up and down. And prices are a mechanism for pooling that distributed knowledge so that anyone can look at the prices and sort of understand roughly what's roughly how to how to coordinate their own action with respect to that. So in this sense, markets are a core a communication mechanism to coordinate distributed knowledge, right? Um, but that's that's the general economic problem is dealing with distributed knowledge. And it's also true in discovery of new knowledge. That you know, I, I'll have some insight into some things, and I might not even be aware of the value or the importance of what I have, or I might be thinking what I have is important and it's absolutely not. Um, but I, I only know that. I mean, so what I've got is fundamental uncertainty about the value of what knowledge I have, what its significance is, and what to do with it. Um, by mixing it with your knowledge, by mixing it with someone else's, we can start to reduce that uncertainty and start to figure out what we know, um, and what we don't know. And, and through that, we can start to get more confidence about the value of the actions we might take. Actually, we should do this, not that. Um, once we're doing that, we can start to form a plan. Okay, if we, I think we can do this. So uncertainty is reducing as we're doing this. Um, our confidence in our actions, our expectations are starting to form and rise. And once with this, we can now start to persuade other people. So I can start to go to someone with some other resources, capital or finance or a machine or access, and go, look, here's what we've figured out. Come join us, and we can do this together. And what you're doing, what you're observing there is this, as we're pooling knowledge, we're reducing uncertainty, we're building up expectations and plans, 
Um, those expectations and plans make it safer for others to cooperate with us, and give us others more confidence. You know, and at some point we go, all right, let's put a wrapper around this. That's a firm, mm. right? So an institutional wrapper. Okay, we're going to do this. Off we go. We put a plan. You know? I, and I, I, I sort of that, see it as like, oh, can, sorry, continue. I mean, what I'm just sort of describing there is that this is the, this is, this is the, you know, in biology or in physics, this is the sort of cloud of gas collapsing in, you know, into mm. a, to the beginnings of a star or the, the, the sort of individual um, particles that together and, and, and form something. But that very early stage process is the it's it's in a world of fundamental uncertainty and unless you've got a mechanism to reduce that uncertainty and start to give you to start to form confidence for plans we have no basis for economic action other than just doing what we we're doing before right mm. so in the absence of that we can't do anything new we just have to keep doing what we we're doing before and you know that was the feudal world right that was the world of the you know apart from there was 10,000 years till relatively recently ago that was the world we lived in. We just kept doing the same stuff over and over again because we had no mechanism, no institutional mechanism to reduce uncertainty and enable us to form new plans. Mm. In fact, the only place that ever took place was usually in, in war. We're going to go and attack them. I've got an idea. Um, so you know, we, we, we saw innovation mostly directed towards stealing stuff or violence or you know, not cooperation, the opposite mm. of cooperation. And what is a market economy? A mechanism to harness that co those forces of cooperation and put it to use in discovering new ways of creating prosperity which is incredible you know that's um so again i don't call that capitalism i call that sort of an institutional market society for the growth of knowledge um i i, I like just discarding capitalism entirely because i think it just causes more problems um than it actually solves um and i like this this um like what you were describing, this reduction of uncertainty, I, I sort of see it as like the, the sketching out of what the fitness landscape might be like. Um, it, yeah. We're getting creative resolution about what um, viable solutions might actually look like. And then you, you get something to test, you see how it, how it flies. And, you know, if it works, you adapt. And if it doesn't work, well, if it doesn't work, you adapt. And if, if it works, then you make a little more adjustments and you climb that hill. So one of the arguments I make around innovation policy and role of government and so on is that that communication that 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 facilitating communicating that information to others um, is a fundamental you know that needs to happen now whether that's in, a, in an industry that's the role of things like conferences or industry associations or trade media or secret societies of people coming together to share information or maybe down at the pub afterwards but there's a just spaces of safe cooperation to share information and knowledge you know are not incidental they're you know they're um, we tend to not treat that as the fundamental thing that's driving this but we you know um it just so happens that every time those things work we get success and i think you know i see a fundamental role of government in coordinating that or, or underwriting that because um those are costs that suffer a common poor resource, a commons, the tragedy of the commons problem. Um, it's easy to free ride on that. It's easy for me not to share my information with anyone else. But if there's a way of lowering the cost of me doing it or incentivizing me to do that or creating a mechanism for me to share that information more broadly. Um, now again, universities are good at that. Um, I like it when governments sponsor networking events and you know, traders, you know, just, just ways of bringing people together to share knowledge. Um, and, and, and the very best types of research institutions aren't just pushing the frontiers of, you know, quantum physics. They're also about creating institutions to bring people together to pull and share information. So, uh, you know, again, I, I like it when government does that sort of stuff. I think that's much underestimated because it's not it's not flash. You don't. You, you can't open an expensive cyclotron or whatever, or building or whatever. It just you know we hosted a, a networking event. Um, but I think those things are fundamentally important, um, just because the you know all the evidence points to the idea that, that that stuff is where ideas come from. Yeah, um, I'd like to shift um, to, I guess something that's got a lot more publicity and excitement around it 
most since 2017, just this whole world of um, uh, cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain, um, because uh, they are new, like radically new ways of doing things. And the next, it, it seems to me and to many others uh, that the century, this century and those that follow will likely be built on uh, these sorts of technologies. Um, so what is your take on uh, distributed ledger technologies as institutions and how they've kind of um, taken shape? And I guess through the lens of, of the innovation commons, what do you think were the, or have been the innovation commons for these things? Has it been Twitter or Reddit or just little uh, forums? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. The, um, so cryptocurrencies, blockchain, distributed ledger technology, I, I'm comfortable with just calling this blockchain, but it's, yeah. it's, it's um, we can argue about exactly what it's called. Um, but this came out of open source software, which is a commons. Um, that's, you know, th this, this, uh, th and this came out of the crypto, the cypherpunk community, which was basically a group of um, people sharing information about encryption technologies and their application. Like, so the innovation commons gave us um, blockchain technology. That's exactly where this came from. Um, interestingly, there is no firms at the beginning there. There's no blockchain company or the Bitcoin company. Um, that came much later. There's no intellectual property rights in this space, or very, very few of those who have tried have mostly failed. Um, so markets didn't work, firms didn't work. Um, there's no government department, government research departments that's, that gave us this, in fact, almost the opposite. Um, so this is one that clearly came out of the commons. Um, the institutional commons gave us this technology. This is a, just exhibit A of, of what this does. But it also gave us open source software. It also gave us the, you know, the, that sort of that. And open source software is just as much a cultural institution for how we build software. Um, we pull, we share, we have rules about att attribution and so on. It is, it's, not a, it's not a public good. It's, it's a commons. There are rules. There is governance. Um, um, there is ways of policing free riding and fixing you know, error in that system. Um, so, so first of all, innovate the um, this whole sort of cryptocurrency blockchain technology came out of the innovation commons, just and, and nowhere else, right? So, thank you, innovation commons, for that one. Um, the other sort of so that's the that's the origin story. But I mean, what what I think is also interesting here is um, the, the nature of blockchain technology. So. I've been absolutely obsessed with this for about three or four years now. I'm co-director of the Blockchain Innovation Hub at RMIT University. We were the world's first social science research institute set up to study blockchain technology from a business school perspective, um, not from a computer science or you know, um, perspective. And the reason that me, innovation economists, and my team, um, which is you know economists and political scientists and lawyers and anthropologists and sociologists and historians, um, all got obsessed with this is that we see this technology, what is interesting about blockchain, the technology, um, where cryptocurrencies are just one application of that technology, is this is the base layer institutional infrastructure for a digital economy. Um, an industrial economy has base layer institutional infrastructure of government. Government makes the money, government makes the, provides the courts, um, which then protects property rights, which provides um, government enforces rules and laws. Government provides a lot of public goods and public infrastructure. It uses the tax system to fund all of that. It uses the voting mechanism to ensure that this, this works effectively and well for all of society. Um, but basically, government administration is the base layer infrastructure for an industrial economy. Um, a digital economy doesn't need it to be that way. A digital economy can make its own money. Um, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, is, is basically private money built as base layer economic infrastructure for a digital economy. Um, smart contracts in, in, on the Ethereum blockchain, for instance, is a way of creating um, prom a way for um, me to make contracts and promises with you and have them automatic machine enforced through machine technologies rather than legal technologies in doing that. Um, if we combine um, digital assets. Um, so we can use tokens, um, we can point to digital, to point to assets in the real world, we can create property rights in those things. Um, these are tokens or NFTs or, or non, you know, other sort of ways of creating um, asset registries. 
for, the, for, for a digital world. Um, once we've got that, we can then create organizations. So these are DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. We can start to rebuild groups of people coming together to cooperate about a common project that will involve pooling resources that are tokenized. And we can vote with that. We can have governance mechanisms and hierarchic control through that. So I mean, so the, the story I'm sort of representing here, we can, we can dig into the details of this, but the reason to be excited about blockchain technology um, and I emphasize blockchain rather than distributed ledger technology, because distributed ledger technology is the corporate version of that story. Blockchain is the decentralized version of it. Is This is initial experimentation around building new institutions that are the base layer infrastructure of record keeping of who, what. Um, what did they agree to, con agreement, promises. Um, all of the elements of trust that record who is involved in these transactions or contracts or cooperation or, or cooperation? Um, what agreements did they make? Promises, contracts. Um, um, what? Um, who owns which assets or which assets are held in common? Um, so we can create common pool assets and so on. But just the basic management of um, the of, of ownership, private ownership, collective ownership, group ownership, variations upon that. Um, promises. Promises are the basis of, of contracting and, and you know, labor employment and so on. Any, any, any way we need to get our agreements into the future, we need to make promises. Um, promises at the moment, we use lawyers and courts and reputations and identity. And um, generally, we need to know each other quite well, and so which limits the scale of that. So there's a whole lot of economic infrastructure that is basically institutions that we don't even notice anymore because they haven't changed for hundreds of years. We don't go, um, what is money? How do we, someone needs to invent money. It's, it's been there, right? It's the, the government provided it. And um, the reason the government is involved in money is that government does taxes as well. So so long as they're making an agreement about what you need to pay them in, we can use that same thing for our money. Um, so, you know, we've got a whole lot of economic institutions that we've never thought of as technologies. We've never thought of money as a technology. We've never thought of contracting as a technology. We've never thought of identity as a technology. We've never thought of um, organizational agreements as a technology. We, we, we just call them, ah, you mean a firm, or you mean, you mean the government, or you mean money, or you mean the courts. Um, you know. So for hundreds, if not thousands of years, with those institutions which are technologies have just had zero technological progress for very long periods of time, for so long that we've forgotten that they are technologies. And then suddenly, 12 years ago, we rediscovered that they were actually technologies because we've got this whole lot of new ways of doing it. So I just, I look at, for me, what blockchain is, is um, a whole new realm of technological innovation in institutions. And normally we think of technological innovation as something that happens to things. Um, you know, machines, materials, um, robots, um, just stuff in the world. We don't think of technological innovation as things that happen to institutions, social rules for cooperation. What blockchain is, is the first generation of a whole new realm of technological change that is focused on institutions. Um, this is surprising to everyone because we've, we just, none of us have experienced this in living memory um, well, this is the first time it's happened, right? Like, the, nothing's ever really changed. Well, no, no technology has changed. The last time it happened was, I want to say, around the middle of the 19th century when we invented calendar time and the work, and when we synchronized clocks. When we synchronized, uh, when we all started having the same clock time, we could all turn up to work at the same time, which gave us the work day. The work day gave us this idea of organizing firms around the work day, which gave us modern corporate organization. That then gave us an even modern finance, and on we go. So, yeah, okay. I think the last time was synchronized clocks, mid middle century. The first that the first use of that was train timetables. But um, again, we don't even think of that as a technology. It's just, of course, it's the have, time. Of course, <laughs> but, no, but um, that's a so that's an institution in the sense that coordinates groups of people to cooperate at very low cost. I'm just going to turn up at nine. I know you're going to turn up at nine. We're all going to turn up at nine and just start doing a thing. Right? We can do that because. Um, of that institution, institutional technology, we've got synchronized time. The, la the time before that was back in the 14th century when we invented 
double entry bookkeeping, which gave us the joint stock company, which gave us the ability to finance, um, to have distinction between finance and control of an organization. Single entry bookkeeping, you have to trust someone. Double entry bookkeeping you, is trustless trustlessness because we can verify um, who is responsible for what because these books have to balance. So that was the last, so, you know, in the last thousand years, we've kind of had, it's happened twice. Now it's happened three mm. times. But those previous two times it happened, which gave us trustless, gave us the corporation and therefore finance and, and modern capitalism, whatever, and then synchronized coordination around time, which gave us um, modern industrial capitalism and the work day and, and, and so on. Um, those were specialist things that, you know, that gave us, a way to organize work. And that's it. It didn't do anything for money or whatever. Synchronizing time was profound for society, but it didn't fundamentally change contracting or you know, whatever. This time, the third time in a thousand years, which incidentally happened in our lifetime, which is incredible, and it happened just 12 years ago. And I can't believe more economists uh, haven't just dropped everything and go, wow, the most interesting thing in economics in a thousand years just happened. I'm going to focus on this. Um, it's I, but again, it's a story for another time as to why the rest of the profession hasn't seen this. But um, what just happened was a new general purpose technology for institutional, for just for um, an institutional toolkit just got built. where We can rebuild a whole range of base layer institutions in an economy, money, contracting, organizations, um, um, assets, registries, identity, right? And we can build it purely out of software digitally on the internet um, for a global economy we can just off it goes um, now that's incredible um, because what we thought the internet was was a way to send messages to each other a communications technology it's amazing at that um, we'd never thought that it was also a economic technology to build economic institutions because we already had those we, um, um, so at the moment we're living in a weird world where we've got both simultaneously. We've got the old ones that were perfected over a thousand, a thousand years, and you know they, they work pretty well, except where they don't. Um, which is, let's say, for two billion people on this planet, they do not work very well. Um, money is horrible in Venezuela. It's it's barely functioning in Iran. Um, the legal system and contracting is more or less broken across at least two continents on Earth. Um, so, you know, we've got a whole lot of failures as well. I mean, it works spectacularly well in Australia, in Europe, in North America, um, in, you know, in, in, in large parts of East Asia. But, um, you know, again, it's costly. We, we, we devote a lot of time to politics. We devote a lot of time to the media. We, we, we have a many lawyers in society and accountants. Um, I'm, I'm going to say one in three people living in these societies is devoted to just providing that economic infrastructure to providing political institutions and, and, and government and, and, and so on. So the idea that we've now got a technology that we can start to substitute some of that out is mind blowing. Um, it's still wildly experimental. It's only 12 years old and really it's only seven years old. And, and strictly speaking, we only just figured out NFTs three months ago. So, you know, there's, so, and, and we only got DeFi sorted, you know, experimentally kind of hmm. last year. So we're, we're, we're crazy early in this. Um, but we're living at a time where we've got both of these things at the same time. And I think what's going to happen is in our lifetimes, we're going to start to see more and more of the economy move to, pure to the digital, not because more physical things become digital, this stuff, but because more of our institutions become digital. And that's new. We've never had digital institutions before. We've had digital communication. We used to have physical communication. We used to have to write stuff down and send it to people and there was physical mail and there was, you know, so on. And then we digitized that. And now we barely use physical mail at all. It's all digital. Um, but the idea that uh, this could also be true of our money, our courts, our agreements, our, our, our um, the the social cooperation that we use, the institutions that we mm. use to organize a society, that these things could be built out of digital, a digital base layer, um, is is still my. I mean, it's it's. I know I, it, it sounds crazy when you say it out loud that you know, we're heading in this direction, um, but that's what blockchain brings. So that that's the significance of blockchain is it's it's a fundamental revolution 
in the technologies of digital in, of, in the digital in the ability of digital innovation to move into the space of institutions. The mm -hmm. first thing it will do is money, then identity. Money plus identity enables us to do contracting. Money, identity, and contracting enables us to do organizations. Money, identity, contracting, organizations enables us to start to build new types of communities and, and, and market systems and exchanges. And on we go. Um, so that's yeah. that's why I'm excited about this. It's, it's, I, I just think this is this is an incredible, um, incredibly disruptive technology, and I, I'm, I'm, what I'm amazed at is how fast it is moving. Um, most technological changes take, you know, electricity was, you know, we kind of realized it was there 1802. You know, by 18, you know, by a century later, we'd started to get control of motors. It was really the 1950s before we electrified everything. 150 mm. years, right? Um, we're 12 years in, and we're already on about generation four of this technology. Um, it's, it's cycle time is months, not mm. decades. Um, and the reason is that nothing is slowing it down. It's pure open source. There's no intellectual property slowing it down. There's very few organizations. Most regulations and restrictions, it, it, I just don't even see it. It's, 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 you know, it's just gone completely around them. And um, they're constructed in such a way that they are impervious to a lot of that, unless the government well, and, really and, cracks and, down. And um, even it's then. In every industry, it's happening around the world. It's happening in open source. And I mean, one of the things that just gives me the most confidence about crypto, the crypto space, is that you look at it and it's young people. It's, you know, it's smart 21 year olds going, wow, I've got an amazing idea. I'm, I, and there's nothing stopping them from building it. So mm. you've got this incredible energy and low barriers to entry where just anyone smart enough to figure out an opportunity is able to immediately put it into black practice. Um, and a lot of these people are digital natives and they've seen like yep. they, they've they have grown up with phones in their hands so they see yep. the analog world and think oh my goodness this yep. can't be and i, I mean I, my friend has had a similar experience going to working in hospitals um they, they, there's just paper everywhere and you know when, you, when you've grown up with uh technology and you know you've just been able to get everything at the you know at the drop of a hat you just type something in you've got the records there or then um yeah, so you what we're seeing aware of the changes that are necessary. I mean, that's entrepreneurship, but it's it's also, I mean, what's also striking about it is is that what you see very clearly in the crypto space is it's not sort of lone genius sitting by themselves. Now, even Satoshi wasn't that. Um, Satoshi was working with some other crypt cypherpunks, um, you know, a small a small group, but that was a community that was cooperating mm. to build that. Um, you know the the thing about the crypto space is that you sh it's it's you know um, it's not an accident that it's so intensive in you know Reddit forums and crypto Twitter and on Discord channels and those sort of social media channels are such a big part of it. They are the innovation commons that is driving this. Um, you know people can share ideas, can cooperate, can. Um, borrow, steal. Um, there's no real stealing because there's no property to steal. It's, it's all, it's all. So nothing is slowing it down, and, and it's and it's happening everywhere. Uh, you know, every country where you've got digital natives, which is more or less everywhere, you've got people going. I wonder what I can do in this space. Um, the capital requirements are minimal. Um, it's all open source. You can just take some, take a project and fork it. Um, you know, we can take something, and by tomorrow we can have something new. Um, again, that's not what the history of innovation looks like. A lot of the history of innovation was um, secret knowledge and capabilities that required vast amounts of capital to do anything and, and, and so on, and, and very slow mediums of communication that you know people didn't know in one country what others were doing for you know, long periods of time. So just all the dials are turned up to 11 on this one, which is why... You know, from an, as an innovation economist, this is just the most um, incredible thing to observe. You're just, you know, you're watching a supernova up close. Uh, we don't normally get to see those. Um, you know, those are historical events that we study you know, in, in history, whereas we're living through this one right now. So, uh, I, I think your enthusiasm will make a few converts. I've got a few friends who have been a bit, um, uh, you know, let's just say hesitant, or you know, no, they, no, they, I, they had they, they had their concerns. But I'm. It's it's it's. But the skepticism is just born 
mean, I, I understand it through the lens of we've never seen an explosion this big up this close before. It's, it's, it's reasonable to believe that this can't possibly be true. Um, and even if, you know, a lot of mistakes will be made, many of the things that we're seeing right now will turn out to be just, wow, that was stupid. Mm -hmm. um, but that's true of every technological innovation revolution, is, is that huge amounts of experimentation, most of it's stupid. Um, but the, the point is to move through those phases as fast as possible, to, to try everything out, to learn from it, and, and, and iterate. And so, you know, I, you know, I think skepticism is healthy in this space, but the idea that if that skepticism is inhibiting you from that learning process or from the then, okay, now we have a problem. And uh, this is where I, I think there is a significant role for government or for, you know, for, for anything, any, any, any sort of, you know, maybe this is a role for philanthropy, um, but just for ways of bringing in as many people as possible into this, this, this conversation, um, this, this experimental cooperative endeavor, um, minimizing the costs of, of, of this experimentation. Um, the main thing I'm worried about right now is, is not what's happening in the blockchain space. What I'm worried about now is what's hap is the existing, existing organizations and industries that are threatened by it, that are organizing politically to lobby to, to have themselves protected. Um, you can see this very clearly in finance, um, where a lot of the, you know, again, existing organizations that are doing very well, like things as that they are, they do not want competition or new ideas in the space. And rather than competing in the market, um, they lobby for political protection by raising the costs of things. Or you know. so, hmm. I, I just you know, to me, it's the political side of this that is the the, the concern, not the economic side. Yeah, um, and I, I also see that the these actions could actually hasten the adoption of these technologies, particularly from I, I think we've seen a number of governments try to crack down on. Um, well, on these technologies, I think there was questions of banning it in, in India, at least at one point. That might have been changed recently. Yeah, they, they and, went back and forth. I think as of today, fifteenth of March, um, it's it's back on again. But back on, yeah. They, they but, see, I see that. I think over the next decade, there's going to be quite a tremendous amount of instability within countries, and um, you know, we're seeing tremendous amounts of money being printed, and perhaps not in the US, perhaps in the US, but in many other countries that this uh, destabilization could cause people to try to move their money towards or into assets that'll hold their, that'll hold its value quite um, quite well. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, perhaps other, other coins. And I can see governments trying to crack down on that. And if they're cracking down on it, then people will be like, well, this is definitely what I need to be doing. And I can, I see this playing out over the next 10 years. And something that I'm even more concerned about is there are some. There are these privacy coins. There are ways in which you can uh, send money or receive money uh, that that are untrackable, at least to my knowledge. And I'm a big fan of government and of taxes because they provide for things. Um, they help. You know, there's healthcare. There's infrastructure. There's um, just the ways in which we're having this conversation. You know, I didn't lay down the 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 fiber. Someone, you know, the government probably did. So I'm concerned about how these technologies could enable people to just avoid taxes, and I'm I'm unsure as to where the the that income could come from to to really pay for um, yes. so, these look, public I, goods. Yes, I, I see your concerns. Um, I, I think these are real concerns, um, but people have been avoiding taxes for this isn't a new thing. Um, so tax avoidance or tax minimization um, is something that you know everyone does to, to you know, the extent that, it's, that, it's, that they can get away with that. Um, I think we've got some new tools now for tax avoidance and tax minimization. Um, you know, the traditional way used to be you just move your assets offshore. You move them into tax havens. Um, so, I mean, and again, I'm a big fan of tax havens. I, I, I like the fact that they exist because what they do is that they discipline bad behavior by governments. Governments can only um, engage in predatory behavior up to the extent of the costs of their citizens fleeing to tax havens and so on. Um, so I think we've got the same type of situation here. So I mean, my, my you know, perhaps Pollyanna-ish view on this is that I, I don't see this as a fundamental problem because I think it improves the quality of government. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I don't, people aren't going to go completely dark. Um, there are costs to doing that as well. 
Um, mm -hmm. There are significant costs if you try and you, know, you can probably hide all your assets if you put enough effort into it. But there's a whole bunch of things you won't be able to do if you do that. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the fact that you might have to live for six months of your life, six months every year in the Cayman Islands is just a tiny fraction of the inconvenience you're going to experience um, in, in this space. So, uh, so I think that there are there are countervailing forces that limit the extent to which that that extends out. But, um, but you know, in that sense, this notion of exit, this notion of people being able of we've now got new options to exit the system, means that on some margins people will exit. Um, that's not good. Um, but we want to look at the reason why they're exiting. Um, what 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 what. What did they feel they weren't getting from society that, that enabled them to feel that that was a, that, that just leaving um, was was a better option? So, um, you know, to that extent, I, I like the idea of cryptocurrencies disciplining money by meaning that the existence of a an alternative stable money that is um, far less resistant to inflation just means that governments can't get away with inflating as much. Um, I, I think net that's a good thing. That, mm. Um, and you know, again, that's, that's always you know, we've always had that exit option in gold. Um, if you were worried about government ruining their currency, you could always just hold gold. And gold, you know, we've, there's always been exit options like that. It's just they've always been a bit inconvenient. You can't pay easily with gold. You've got to worry about someone stealing it, and it's where do you even buy it from? So now we've got digital gold. Yeah. Um, so more people have now have that exit option. Um, yeah, no, I hadn't really thought about that. So that that really uh, makes things, I, I guess, makes me a bit more optimistic uh, in a way because I was quite concerned uh, about that. But um, you've given me reason, like to to I wouldn't say rest, put my fears aside, but just to to uh, yeah, quell them just just a little bit. Well, I mean, just just to reiterate that, what my point there is is that I you know this is an example of competition, and the thing about competition is that it not only potentially provides an incentive. It, it, it disciplines. Um, mm. It disciplines bad behavior if you've got a competitor. So the thing about being a monopolist is I can raise prices because you can't stop me, because there's no one competing with me to discipline my bad behavior. And the thing about governments is that they can be predatory. Um, they can take your stuff. They can, um, you know, and a lot of retail politics is really about finding a large group that wants a small group to be punished for something and, 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 and making that transfer. So, you know, this and you know these are precisely the ones that we're looking for the exit option. So it's mm. it disciplines it disciplines populist politics, and populist politics is often some of the worst types of politics where um, where people don't have a, a viable exit option. So again, I you know from a from a long term perspective, societies that have these kinds of exit options do tend to be healthy democracies. Um, Healthy, well-functioning democracies that don't tend to get that don't tend to completely collapse. So, I, I'm more worried about the op, the the absence of an ability to exit rather than. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd like to just talk briefly about um, NFTs because they've been. I think uh, is his name Beeple um, made the fifty six Beeple sixty nine million dollar purchase through. Um, I don't know the name of the the auction house, but um, that's oh, that's uh, Christie's. Christie's. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, so a lot of people are thinking, like, what the hell's the point in um, you know owning digitally, um, uh, you know, a digital piece of art or um, anything really? Um, it could be essays, papers, podcasts. Perhaps this podcast will be minted. Who knows? Um, it'd be appropriate. Um, so, what's your take on? Um, NFTs. Oh, I, think, I think they're fantastic. So an NFT is a is a non fungible token. So what is a fungible token? A fungible token is something like Bitcoin, um, where one bit I can give if I've got one Bitcoin, um, I'll swap it for another Bitcoin. They're fungible in the same way that a dollar is fungible for another dollar. Um, a non fungible token is more like a property deed on a house. My house is not swappable for your house because they're different. Mine's blue, yours is yellow, or mine's got stairs, yours doesn't. So whenever you've got unique assets, you've got non-fungibility. So the, the whole idea of fungibility and non-fungibility, we've already got in the economy. Money, fungible, um, equities, all BHP, BHP, one BHP share is fungible for another BHP share, but BHP, the company, is not fungible for Rio Tinto. Right? So... Um, 
So what is a non-fungible? So a cryptocurrency is taking that fungible thing and moving it into the digital realm. A non-fungible token is the same thing. It's just saying um, we can do this for assets as well. We can have things in the real world that are and give them digital property rights. A non-fungible token is a digital property right or a digital um, record of ownership of a unique thing um, where my artwork, artwork is an obvious non-fungible, but just most things are non-fungible. Mm. So what are NFTs? NFTs are the early stage experimentation of private property rights. Um, at the moment, government provides property rights for providing a register. So you know you own your house. When I buy your house off you, um, how I know you own it is we go to the government register and, and it'll have your name next to that property deed number. That's how I know you own it. And then we write my name in and cross your name out and now it's my house. Right, so that's how we deal with non-fungibility in asset registries and property rights. Um, that's not a bearer asset. That require, That's a centralized asset. There's a single registry and each state has a registry of who owns. So, so first of all, we can only do this with things where we've got a list of all of the stuff. So we tend to do it with houses, property, cars. There's a, you know, the, there's a, you know, there's a register with, if you own a car, with your car registration VIN on it and then your name next to it. And that's how we know you own it. Um, and when you sell it to me, we've got to update that registry. So that's expensive, it's slow, it works, um, but we only use it for some of the assets in an economy. There's many, many assets in an economy. Um, this is mine, I can't prove it, other than the fact that I'm holding it. Um, there's no registry that's got my name next to this. We could make an NFT of this, and then I could establish that this is mine, and when I give you this, I'll mm. give you the NFT, and now you've got proof that, that it's yours, because there's a digital bearer asset that establishes that. So um, this is an experiment. NFTs are an experiment in what it means to create a private system of property rights. Um, it's not an alternative parallel system. You could you know, create one yourself. So at the moment, these NFTs are private with respect to each blockchain. So the Ethereum blockchain has a record of, of, of various things. But note what's going on. The Ethereum blockchain is now playing the same role as the Australian government in terms of creating a single registry of proof about who owns the thing. Um, the creation of NFTs is, a, is an entrepreneurial initiative to create a new type of institution that's a bearer asset, that when I give it to you, you've got now got an ownership record. Now, I can verify that by looking at the blockchain. I can go to um, Block Explorer and look up and go, oh, yeah, there it is. There's, there's, you can prove, and you've got your private keys, so you can prove that it's yours. So you can do all the things that property rights can do. You can verify that it's yours, independently. I can verify that it's yours independently. We can establish a, um, a unique proof of transfer by looking at the transfer of the, of the asset on, on the blockchain. Um, we can, so we've got scarcity, we've got uniqueness, we've got, um, you know, now we have to worry about whether this can be attacked or overwritten, so, so long as this blockchain is secure. So the Ethereum one I trust more than, say, Dogecoin. Um, as the foundation for this, but we could do NFTs on Dogecoin and we can do NFTs on Ethereum and this would be like Switzerland versus, I want to pick a broken country, Haiti or something like that, that, that maybe it's a bit more dodgy in terms of underlying property rights. So that's what NFTs are, a radical new experiment in the property rights part of base layer infrastructure of an economy. Um, it wasn't, they were invented by crypto, um, by crypto, crypto punk. kitties. Crypto oh, crypto punk. Crypto punk actually. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. But that was the first one, right? That was the, that was a wild experimentation. You go, ha, ah, that's digital cats on the blockchain. That's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Um, yes. But it was the first experiment in creating peer to peer digital property rights that could potentially apply to anything you attach that cat to. Um, NFTs are the generalization of that. We go, wow, well, we can do that for art. Mm. Um, I've now got colleagues going, wow, well, we could do that for our academic papers. We yeah. can do it for anything we want to establish a digital property right that can be transferred, that, can, that is made of something digital that can be transferred and create ownership. Now, if we can create ownership, we can create finance. I can now finance this. I can create contracts. I can create futures contracts. So I can now start to build 
a venture capital model around my podcast ownership or my artwork. And what can I do? I'm now I'm able to build a new financing model for the creative industries. Um, what happens when I sell my artwork? I've now got I've now reinvented the resale royalty scheme because I can have a trailing commission where everyone who previously owned it will get a fraction of whatever the new value is. And at the moment we do that with a government department in Canberra that does a statistical sample of a collection of mostly high value artworks. We limit it at a thousand dollars and above. There's a whole lot of stuff that doesn't get included. Um, every time we do it, it costs about four hundred dollars to administer that thing. So basically it doesn't work, right? Mm. Um, NFTs, we can fix resale royalties. We can do, we can fix finance, venture finance. We can create low cost venture finance for the art sector. We can basically reinvent the economic institutions of finance, property rights, um, ownership transfer, retail, um, trailing commissions, and so on, um, all without ever mentioning the word intellectual property, lawyers, accountants. Um, government bureaucrats running large arts administration and agencies. We haven't politicized it. We don't have to have a committee that votes on which one gets in. I've just made a very low cost infrastructure to provide all of the things that we wanted. How do I finance this? How do I establish ownership? How do I establish transfer? How do I pay off all the people that contributed to it? And how do I do this for um, basically 37 cents of gas fees or you know, maybe $12 or whatever it is. But, yeah. Um, and how do I do it in such a way that I'm absolutely confident that this is safe and hasn't been hacked and isn't been corrupted and, and works globally? It doesn't just work. You know. So, I mean, you know, that's, I've, I've painted a very rosy picture there, um, but that's the vision, right? Now, whether that actually works in reality or we just end up with lots of, lots of spam cats on the internet, um, you know, there's a worst case scenario and a best case scenario, but um, that's what NFTs are. NFTs are an experiment in digital property rights. And we haven't had an experiment in property rights since 1066, right? It's been a long time since we've really tried to, not 1066, maybe 1632, the um, invention of copyright. Um, so it's, it's been a long time between innovations in, in this space. Um, but we just, got a, we just got 12 of them yesterday um, and you know, a whole bunch of it recently. So very exciting times for innovation. I mean, the whole theme of this talk is innovation and institution. Yeah, and it's just that how this used to be wildly expensive. You used to have to build a country and start an army and defend yourself and create a parliament and then a media and then you could build institutions. Now, some code. Cool. Yeah. We can, we can, we can at very low cost innovate in institutions, which means we can potentially find some new ones on that sort of landscape. And you know, we can search the lens, the institutional landscape. And try and find some better ones, or cheaper ones, or faster ones, or ones that fit better. Or, you know, it, and it may well turn out that lots of the ones we've currently got are pretty good, um, and they just need some some digital enhancements. Yeah, yeah, I think that might be the case because people are people at the end of the day, and we can't digitize ourselves um, well, yeah. no, so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I know that we're running uh, close to uh, our time. Um, are you happy to wrap up uh, within the next yeah. five minutes? Thank you for, for this discussion. I've, I've really enjoyed this. And, um, you know, I, yeah. I, I think this theme throughout this of, you know, why is blockchain interesting? What is going on in economics and so on is what I've wanted to point towards is two things is um, innovation is a phenomenally interesting, a, a far more general problem um, than we're thinking. Um, and that the idea of institutions is far more central to understanding how economies work than I think a lot of, um, you know, than, than you would get in an undergrad education in economics, where you, you, you barely ever come across institutions. They're just in the background. Um, but innovation in institutions is, I think, the, the, the thing that is most exciting about what's happening in the world today. And that's happening in blockchain. But the thing is, once you can do that, we can then bring in all the other digital technologies. So once we've got digital institutions, we can start to layer on AI and, and digital intelligence onto that. And we can start to create, you know, VR gives us a digital landscape in which we can move. Yeah. And, and 3D printing I'm, means we can, we can make anything physical digitally wherever we need to do that. And, you know, we can basically move the economy into the digital space, which is not 
exactly the same as moving it onto the internet or moving it online or you know, into cyberspace or whatever was the you know, earlier metaphors. I think it's digitization is the, is the real key. Um, but you know, digitization is a new form of automation. And, you, and what we've, we've, we've you know, the last 200 years, you know, our, our, our modern history is basically built around the idea that automation is something that takes place over the physical parts of the world to stuff, to machines, to work, to you know, moving stuff around, making it better, stronger, faster. We've never had automation work over institutions, over human over the, the mechanisms of human cooperation. Those are, those are, those are ancient. Mm. Um, we've never thought of those as technologies. All that just changed recently, but it changed. Blockchain was the final, final part of that story, but it was only possible because of internet, open source software, high power computing. You know, there was a whole lot of precursor electricity. There was a whole lot of precursor technologies that had to be put in place to get us to the point where we can now innovate in institutions. But you know, since 2013, we've been able to innovate in institutions, and you know, that's the world. You know, this is a before times and after times distinction, I think. Yeah, brilliant. Um, well, Jason, where can people find you online um, if people want to, you know, follow so, your work, catch up? Follow me on Twitter um, at Prof Jason Potts, Twitter handle. Um, I work at the Blockchain Innovation Hub at RMIT University. Um, just search for us there and you know, see the sort of stuff we do. We, we push out a lot of the work we do, we push out into Medium posts. We have a podcast called Mint and Burn um, that we produce almost weekly, um, where we look at a lot of the academic discussion around, around blockchain technology. But um, follow us on Twitter, check out our podcast, um, go to our website. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. Well, Jason, it's been a pleasure. Yes, mine too, really enjoyed it.